All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our Lunch and Learn. Um, my name is Brittany Clarkson, and I'm a health educator with the Office of Health Promotion. And for this uh, week's Lunch and Learn, we are going to be talking all about consent. Um, so this uh, Lunch and Learn is actually a part of the events happening on campus for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, there have, has been events um, pretty much every day this month, um, and so we're glad to be involved um, with this month that we stop to recognize every year. Um, some events that I'd like to highlight that are coming up tomorrow is the Male Sexual Assault Victimization Panel, and that's going to be held at 2 p.m. in the CJ courtroom, um, so definitely check that out if you're interested. And then this Thursday at 6 p.m. is the Take Back the Night Rally in March. And so that's always a really, really um, interesting and very well put together event to be a part of where students and staff and faculty, um, really anyone who is interested gets together. There's um, a march um, on a route around campus. Um, and then you get to hear from some speakers um, who represent different organizations that um, cater to um, survivors of sexual assault um, and also those who support them. So awesome, awesome event. Definitely take advantage of that if you can. So we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, Lunch and Learn. And like I said, it's all about consent. Um, as much as I try to keep this, you know, very light, um, there, there are a bit of heavy parts to this presentation. Um, so here are my infamous trigger warnings. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about consent um, and, and we'll get a little bit into um, a bit of sexual information. Um, and of course we will be talking about rape and sexual assault. So if those things are triggering, <clears throat> or concerning to you, please feel free to take care of yourself. Um, so step away from the Zoom, step away from the YouTube, um, give yourself a chance to breathe, and if necessary, contact someone from the Counseling Center. Um, also, I am not a doctor and I cannot um, treat, diagnose, or cure any past, present, or future health conditions or mental health conditions. Um, so definitely, if any of this information sparks you um, to seek medical attention, please see your primary care physician or your primary mental health um, practitioner. So being that we'll be discussing consent, um, let's quickly define what sex is because we are mostly going to be talking about sex in the context, or consent in the context of sexual activities. So we're defining sex as stimulation of sexual organs between consensual partners. Um, so that underlying word consensuals is extremely important because without consent is no longer sex, then it is um, rape. <clears throat> So this includes vaginal sex, anal sex, manual sex, which can include the use of um, sex toys, um, and also all forms of oral sex. So in our office, in the Office of Health Promotion, we do like to promote healthy and normal sex if it's something that you choose to do, right? Um, but we, we get the question a lot of what is normal, right? So really whatever is normal is going to be up to you, whatever is healthy and feels right for you. Um, but just know that, that have the act of having sex is an extremely normal process. It's a human process, right? Um, I, there's a statistic that says about 98 to 99% of all people living will have sex in their lifetime, right? So just extremely normal, very, very common, although we tend to see it as a little bit of a taboo subject, right? So sex is normal, right? So young adults have sex about 80 times per year. So that's roughly, you know, one once to twice a week, right? And we also understand that your sexual preference can change. 
right? What does it for you today may not be what turns you on tomorrow. And something that you're not interested in today, you may be interested in later on in your life. Um, so no one is, you know, saying you have to assign yourself to a sexuality or an orientation or a preferred sexual activity. All that changes as you change. However, no matter what type of sex you choose to engage in, um, the choice to engage in sexual activity should be, again, consensual, because without that consensual piece, it is no longer sex. Um, it should be safe, meaning that there's no risk for disease transmission, injury, um, mental or emotional scarring, or unplanned pregnancy. Um, and it should be healthy, right? Um, something that's not going to, again, leave you emotionally, mentally scarred, physically um, injured or anything like that. So consensual, safe, and healthy. Those are all the things that must exist um, within sexual activity. And, and again, healthy sex is good for you. So when you have um, consensual, safe, healthy sex, there is, uh, documented and researched health benefits, right? So we see that for relationships that have already introduced sexual activity as a regular part of their relationship, um, there is greater satisfaction when um, partners have sex at least once a week, right? But that's not saying that you can't have a satisfying relationship without sex, because you definitely can have a satisfying relationship if sex is not involved. But for those who have already introduced sex into the relationship, um, there is a greater sense of satisfaction if there is sexual activity at least once a week. Um, stress, stress relief um, is a very good side effect of having healthy, safe, and consensual sex. Um, sex can also improve your mood, it can improve your self-image, how you feel about yourself, how you see yourself in the mirror. Um, you can improve your physical fitness, you know, having sex is a, is a physically active activity, so it can improve your physical fitness and then burn some calories. It can provide you with a better immune function, which I think is something that we're all chasing a little bit in this era of COVID. We're all looking for ways to stay healthy and to uh, reduce the risk of getting sick. So better immune function, um, and then also reduced instances of pain. So let's get into consent. We're, we'll talk about kind of the ins and outs of consent. What is it? Why is it? How you get it? Things like that. So um, I love this little chart um, because I just think it's consent in a nutshell, right? When should you ask for consent? Every, every single time, okay? So um, there are a bunch of different kind of acronyms um, for consent or um, ways to remember consent. There's you know, things like fries, but we kind of keep it simple to three main points, right? So first we say consent is mutual. Um, that means that it's agreed upon between all parties. Um, consent is active and it can be withdrawn anytime, right? So mutual meaning whether it's one partner, two partner, three partners, everyone involved is on the same page as to what activity is about to happen and everyone 100% agrees that they'd like to participate in the activity that they're all understanding to happen, right? Um, and the part about uh, consent being, being active uh, means that consent is living, right? It can be given and it can be taken away at any point in time. So um, having started a sexual activity doesn't necessarily mean that consent is present through to the end, right? A person can change their mind at any point. So we say that a consent is living or consent is active. Um, and so that kind of challenges a, uh, a belief or a thought or a practice that some, some folks held, you know, not too long ago about things like sex contracts, right? Saying that, you know, I am signing this contract to say that um, I am willingly consenting to this sexual experience with this person. Right, but the only problem with that is, is that once it's down on a piece of paper, you know, the ink is dry, there it is, but consent is not a dry ink subject, right? Consent can be taken 
back, it can be retracted, it can be withdrawn. And so there's no way for a written contract like that to account for how, how consent can be retracted. So just definitely something to be aware of and keep in mind that consent can be taken away at any point in time for whatever reason. Next, we say consent is freely given. So that means that it doesn't exist if there's coercion, blackmail, intimidation, or made under threats, right? Um, another way of uh, expressing this is that consent should be enthusiastic. So a person giving their consent should not feel like they are obligated to. They should not feel like that they, if they don't, something bad will happen, or if they don't give consent, something um, some benefit that they were receiving would be taken away or anything like that, right? It's giving consent should be something that's um, excitable, right? Something that comes with a positive emotion and not something out of obligation um, or as a scare tactic to have something taken away or some, something bad happen to them. And then lastly, we say consent is informed. So that means that it does not exist if a person is impaired due to alcohol, drugs, if they're unconscious, if they're mentally impaired, or if they're below the legal age of consent for the state. Okay. Um, so we had a, um, our Spring into Health um, event that we had a couple of weeks ago, we explored what it looks like when you mix um, participating in alcohol or, or consuming alcohol with sexual relationships. So that's on our YouTube page, um, our SHSU um, Student Health Services YouTube page. I really encourage you to go back and take a look at that because we really kind of talk about how is consent affected by alcohol use um, and what does it mean to be intoxicated and what does it mean to be impaired when giving consent. So definitely take a look at that uh, video um, and let us know if you have any questions about that. So we talked about what consent is, right? Um, consent is mutual, consent is freely giving, consent is informed. But what about what consent is not? Um, that tends to be a bigger list, even one that we cannot um, fully encapsulate in this particular um, lunch and learn. Um, but some things that consent does not, consent is not silence, right? Um, so we talked about consent being informed. So if someone is passed out or is unresponsive and you ask them a question, you're probably gonna be met with silence. Um, so that does not give you a yes, right? That does not give consent. Um, there's a saying that an absence of a no does not mean yes, right? So just because you do not hear no doesn't automatically mean that it's a yes. Um, and then also if a person is maybe you, you ask for a specific act or you begin a specific act and they just like really clam up and you know turn inward and just don't say a word, that's a huge red flag that consent may not exist in this situation. Um, past consent is not consent, right? Um, so just because you've had a, a sexual relationship or a sexual history with a person doesn't mean that you got a, a hall pass, right? Or an open door for sexual activities from now on, right? I like to use the example that if my brother asked me to use my car, you know, for a day, and I allow him, you know, that that is what it is. I consented to let him use my car. That doesn't mean that he can come into my house, grab my keys and take my car anytime he wants to, right? He still has to ask, he still has to get consent. So past consent doesn't mean present or future consent. Um, consent is not forced. Um, and so that could be expressed or implied. So if uh, that kind of goes back to consent being freely given, right? You can't force somebody to say, yes, I consent to this. Because even if they say yes, if they did so under duress or under, you know, as a result of blackmail um, or anything like that, then it's, it's, it's a 
verbal and vocal, yes, but the way you got it was, it was illy gained, right? Um, and so that wasn't true consent because it was forced. And you took that person's choice um, of true consent away. Um, so um, consent, again, consent does not exist if a person is impaired and they don't have the um, mental or physical faculties needed to make such a decision. Um, and that can be as a result of drugs um, or alcohol. It can be as a result of um, some mental health issues. Um, just anything that would take a person out of, take away their ability to make an informed um, decision. Um, consent is not automatic for relationships, right? Um, and this extends to um, sexual relationships, maybe relationships that are just purely for sexual activity for hooking up. This could be where uh, this could be um, exclusive relationships, maybe dating relationships. Um, this could even extend to um, marriages and long-term commitment relationships, right? Your status in that relationship does not automatically um, give consent to the partners, right? So it's kind of weird to think that married people still need to get consent from their spouse, um, but consent still exists in those type of relationships. Just because you are um, in a committed relationship, just because maybe you're legally married or you're exclusive with another person, um, doesn't mean that consent is automatically unnecessary. A person, regardless of their status in a relationship, always has the right to um, say yes or say no um, to sexual activity and maintain bodily autonomy. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, consent is not contractual. Uh, you cannot sign a, a contract saying that consent is present, sign on the dotted line, because it can be taken away at any point in time. And then um, consent is not a swipe right, right? So, and one thing that we saw with COVID is that we were all home, we weren't physically going out and meeting people. So um, dating apps, saw a huge surge, right? Everybody was on Bumble and Tinder and Grindr and all of the different apps, POF. Um, but flirting and um, sexting and talking sexually on an app and matching on an app uh, does not give consent, right? Um, that is communication. Um, it can often lead to sexual situations, but it doesn't make them mandatory. It doesn't um, give you, even if a person says, you know, I want to do this and this while they're talking to you on, you know, Instagram or Twitter or on, on dating app. Um, once you see each other in person, all, it's like all that never even existed, right? Um, so you have to maintain um, consent and respectful relationship. Um, even off the, the dating app, right? So just because you match with somebody doesn't mean that you've got the green light to do whatever sexual activity that you want. All right, so I have this conversation with students quite often when I do this presentation about how do I get consent or how do I ask for consent? So I found this video and I thought it was a pretty accurate um, description of kind of how a lot of us feel when it comes to consent. And again, it's there's no shame, right? There, we're all here to learn. Um, so if this feels like you, then this feels like you. Um, but if you know not, then that's okay too. We hear a lot about consent and why it's important, but we don't hear a lot about how people ask for consent. So we're here today in Hollywood trying to figure out how people ask for consent. Do you think consent's important? Yes, very important. Depends on what it is, but yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Of course. Why? Because I think people need permission to move on. Because you're allowing it to happen. Uh, if not, then it's it feels inappropriate in a sense. No means no, and that's pretty important. I think no is pretty important. Because otherwise, 
like you're taking advantage of someone, doing stuff to them that they don't want. So how would you ask for consent? Can you show me how you would ask for consent? It depends on the situation. That I do not know. Not too sure. That's a tricky one. Is it? Yeah, because I reckon it can be implied as well. I've never been in that situation, honestly, to ask. As far as that, it's kind of just happened. Can I touch you? I would formally have to ask if they would want to do the certain uh, thing that they want to do. Um, are you comfortable? Can I touch your wiener? So would you ever verbally ask for it? Do you think that's important? I think mean, it's important, but I don't think it, like anyone would do it. Really? Why not? I mean, it's kind of just like one of those things. If you click with something or someone, something's going to like lead to another thing. And it's just like, OK, we're here. If I want it, then I'm going to let it happen. But if not, I'm going to say no. Asking is not a bad thing. <laughs> Very true. So most people agree consent is important. But when it comes to thinking about how to ask for consent, people didn't really know what to say. How would you ask for consent? We're not kids anymore. Like, we know what's going to lead to when we go home with someone. What? Sex. Right. If that's what you want. <laughs> what... So, I thought that was a very interesting video just because, you know, when the host, she says, so, you know, is consent important? Everyone said yes, right? Everyone said, yes, it's important to get consent. You need to respect the other person. Um, it's very important. But then when she gets to, well, how do you give consent? It's like crickets, right? Silence. Nobody really had much to say at first. And then when they started offering up suggestions, they were just kind of, you know, awkward, right? And and that's okay, right? Consent can be awkward as long as it's there, right? So talking about how do you get consent, right? Three easy steps. Ask. First is to ask, right? That, that, that is the first, the biggest, the, the most important step is simply to ask, right? It can feel awkward, but you know, my my grandmother always told me, close mouth, don't get fed, right? If there is something that you want, you first need to ask. Once you have asked and made your request, then it's very, very important to watch for your response, for watch for your partner's response. Um, and this watching is a little bit more intense if you don't know your partner. If this is a partner that you have been with forever, that you have regular interactions with, or that you've been with, you know, long term, it's easier to kind of pick up on their verbal and their nonverbal cues, right? Because you know them, you know when they're uncomfortable or sad or stressed or excited. Um, so it'll be, you know, pretty simple for you to decipher what they're feeling. Um, but if this is a first time partner or one that you're not very familiar with, you'll want to make sure that you ask very explicitly and that you watch for their cues, for their verbal cues and for their nonverbal cues. You know, if they're saying, you know, I guess, and they're shifting around very uncomfortably, they're looking away, um, they're not, you know, making eye contact, then maybe you want to have a conversation about if they're actually comfortable right? And you want to listen, right? So, so watching for those nonverbal cues and then listening to what they're verbally saying and not just what they're saying, but how they're saying it, right? We talked about how consent should be enthusiastic, right? And so it, you can tell in a person's tone when, you know, they're saying something maybe out of obligation or if they're not super excited about it versus when they're really excited about something right um it's kind of like when my I go home and I hang out with my sister and she has this restaurant that I hate and she loves to go there and so she's like hey do you want to go out to eat sure I'd love to go out to eat she's like okay let's go to blah 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 I'm like fine uh, right I don't really want to go I don't like that restaurant at all um so my my verbal cues are a lot different than if you'd be like, you know, hey, let's go to Cheesecake Factory. Yes, I'm game. Let's go. I'm paying. Let's hurry up. I need cheesecake, right? So those are two totally different reactions. Um, and, and it's just something that you have to be mindful of, to listen for, to watch for, right? So 
I understand that consent can be kind of awkward, right? And I I absolutely love um, the show, The New Girl, and they had a, an amazing episode. So if you are interested, I think it's on Netflix, go and watch season two, episode 30, uh, 23. Um, but this is kind of how I feel people view consent. So he and I were the founding members of the Gender Equality Society. Also the only members of the Gender Equality Society. We both asked each other to prom in the spirit of gender equality, and we both said yes. Okay, okay. get to it. No one Oregon cares. sucks. I'm gonna take off your dress. Do I have your permission? Yep. Yep. Um, I can't find the zipper. Oh. There is no zipper. Um, I made this dress and my mom sewed me in. So. Um, maybe I can try it in the um, abdominal area here. Is that okay? Do I have permission? Yes. Do you have my permission? Yeah, just, unwind um, the... No, maybe if, um, you know, um, because maybe you could just rip it. I, I just want to make sure you're feeling safe. No, all. no, no. I, I feel, like, so safe and, like, I've never felt, like, more safe. Well, do I have your permission? Just be a man and rip it off. So in that video, you know, they're kids, right? They're supposed to be after prom. And the whole story is about um, Jess's first sexual experience. And, you know, you've got these two kids. They're only the only members of the Gender Equality Society. And so, of course, you know, uh, the, the, the guy in the situation is like, I just want to make sure you're safe. I want to make sure you're feeling safe. Do I have your permission? Right. And so while he's asking and he's informing Jess of what he wants to do, what he's going to do, um, it's it's a little deflated, right? It's um, it's it's pretty awkward and not very sexy at all, right? Consent doesn't have to be that way. It really it really doesn't. But I feel like that's what we think of when we say to ask um, for the things that you want sexually, right? We think that it's that that real weird, awkward. Can I kiss you? Can I kiss you again, right? And, and while that is um, a method of consent, it doesn't have to be so awkward, right? So, so what does consent look like in real life, right? There are so many ways that you can gain consent for sex. Um, these are just a few, right? Um, so going back to first, you have to ask, right? Can I kiss you? Do you want to have sex? How far do you want to go? How do you want it? What would turn you on? What would make you feel good? Do you want to try something new? Here is that something new I'm proposing, right? So can I go down on you? So it can be very, very sensual and very sexy, right? And then once you ask, you want to continue to check in, right? And so that's kind of what the guy was doing with Jess. He's like, I just want to make sure you're all right. Are you still okay, right? You do want to continue to check in, but again, it can be very sensual, right? Um, how do you like it? Do you want me to slow down? Do you want me to speed up? Do you want to do something else? Do you want to change positions, right? It can be, um, it doesn't have to be so awkward. It doesn't have to be so robotic right? Just continue to check in, continue to ask. And remember, you need to watch for their verbal cues, right? Maybe if they're squinting and looking like they're in pain, you kind of do a little bit more checking in. Um, and then you want to listen for their nonverbal cues, look for their nonverbal cues and listen for their verbal responses, right? So it doesn't have to be awkward. You don't have to be like Jess and her high school sweetheart. You know, you can make it fun. You can make it sexy. So I have a little activity, and if you would like to respond in the chat, you can. Um, otherwise, you can just kind of think over it. So I have, um, I think, two scenarios, um, and so I'll read each scenario, and then just let me know if um, I think there's some follow-up questions. Is there consent present? And then how do you know there's consent in the situation or not? So the first one, um, Kim and Lee have been dating for a semester. When Kim's roommate left their apartment due to COVID, Lee moved in to help pay rent. After being quarantined together for months and regularly having sex, Kim started feeling overwhelmed with being alone with Lee all the time. One day, Lee tried to initiate sex with Kim like he always has, but Kim pulled away and said she didn't feel like it. Lee got frustrated and said, you usually like it when I do that, and why are you acting new all of a sudden? 
Kim really likes Lee, but needs some time alone. Lee begins to question whether or not Kim loves him. He also says things like, we've been going out for a semester and I'm helping you out by living here. He continues to say things like, you would have had to move home if it weren't for me. The least you can do is give me a hit every once in a while. After some time, Kim finally gives into his request. So the question is, what is the problem with this scenario? Is it okay if we speak instead of putting it in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm thinking it's because it's not quite consent because the other partner pressured the, I don't remember the names exactly, but they pressured the other one into doing something from they didn't want to do and wouldn't have been willing to normally unless they kind of chipped away at it. And it's just not very healthy, some relationship to me. Yeah, absolutely. And and, it, and in this situation, right, um, Kim found herself in kind of a vulnerable situation where she needed assistance helping to pay for rent. So, you know, her, um, the guy she was dating at the time kind of swooped in and was helping with that. And then he kind of threw it back in her face and used it as a justification for um, giving him the, the sex that he wanted when he wanted, right. And we know that that's a um, that's a type of coercion, right? Um, feeling it's like the quid pro quo. Um, uh, new in the set in the chat said it was forced sexual intimidation, right? It's like I'm helping you out with rent, so the least you can do is give me sex, and um, that's not a consensual situation at all. And it's not an ethical situation at all. It's very uh, it's, a, it's a toxic kind of relationship um, when sex is the expectation, um, whether or not the person you know, wants it. Okay, the next scenario. Kelly and Quinn matched on Bumble and have been texting for the last week. They meet up at Three Spoons and then after go back to Kelly's room. Quinn has been teasing Kelly about what they would do if they were alone together all week. So Kelly was expecting to have sex. Halfway through foreplay, Quinn changes their mind and tells Kelly it's not a good idea. Kelly, who was already all worked up, decides to continue anyway and have sex with Quinn. So is there consent in this scenario? I don't think so because she didn't. She said she wanted to stop and the other one wouldn't listen. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so this is this is an example of consent being withdrawn, right? So um, there was an expectation due to um, activity on this dating site that they were gonna get together and they were gonna do these sexual things. Um, and they started off with a little bit of foreplay and then the consent was, was, was withdrawn, right? Um, so Quinn had the... Um, had all of the right to withdraw consent, and it's something that Kelly should have been respectful of, right? And, and you said no consent can be withdrawn at any time, so absolutely. Um, and so the last question says, uh, does Quinn teasing Kelly with sex equal consent? And the answer is no, right? Um, foreplay or teasing or sexting, um, none of that equates to consent, especially if given the fact that once you become physical, it is withdrawn. Um, you can't be held to something that you said before. Um, in our last scenario, Jordan asks Ryan if they would like to have sex. Neither have been drinking. Ryan thinks about it then says, absolutely, that sounds lovely, and they have sex. Was there consent in this scenario? I, and in my I mind, think I'm, so. Yes, absolutely. Cool. I was going to say in my mind, I imagine all, everybody nodding their head yes, right? <laughs> um, so um, neither Jordan nor Ryan were drinking, so they were both perfectly informed of the decision they were making. One partner asked, the other person said yes, they did their thing, consent all around, right? 
So we talked about what consent is, um, how to ask for consent. Um, we did some scenarios. Now, what do you do if your consent is violated? What happens if um, someone ignores your um, consent or um, uh, assaults you sexually um, or you find yourself having been a victim um, of non-consensual sex, right? So there's a lot that, that happens um, and this may not be the correct um, response or the correct order for everyone, um, but these are some places that a person can start, right? After their consent has been violated. Um, the first thing a person wants to do is ensure their own safety, right? So that can come in the form of um, getting out of this, the dangerous situation, of, that can come in the form of seeking support um, from law enforcement, calling 911. Um, it can come in the form of having a family member or a friend come over to, you know, help or to take them to a different location. But the immediate um, ensurement of safety is uh, paramount more than anything. So first you wanna ensure your own safety. Um, then seek medical attention. Um, and on here on campus, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, here on campus, there's a student health center that can point students in the right direction. Um, and there's also Huntsville Memorial Hospital right across the highway. Um, reach out to su for support. That can be on campus support. It can be community support. It can be support within your family, your friend group, any of your social circles. Um, process the experience, right? So um, oftentimes when really anything negative happens to a person, it can seem isolating. It can seem like you're the only person going through it. Um, no one else understands. Maybe there's some embarrassment or shame associated with what has happened. Um, and you just kind of want to move past it and forget it, right? Um, but any of those unprocessed feelings or experiences um, can contribute to a lot of mental health um, challenges further down the line, right? It, um, those kind of things have the tendency to just kind of come back and eat at you and gnaw at you until you properly dealt with them. But processing that experience is not easier said than done, but extremely important. Um, then a person will want to consider their legal options. Um, whether or not they would like to pursue legal action against the person who violated them. Um, and whether or not they pursue legal action um, does not make them any less um, in need of resources um, or entitled to them, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, reconnect with community and friends. Again, um, things like this can be very isolating. So it's important to surround yourself with your, you know, some people call it your tribe, your social circle, um, your family. So really lean on that support system and then engage in ongoing self-care, which self-care is highly suggested for anybody, but especially if you've been the victim of a violent crime or if you've been violated in any way, um, you really, really wanna make sure you're taking care of yourself. So when it comes to reporting to law enforcement, um, I, just, I, I first wanna say that you are not obligated to report to law enforcement. Um, and if you choose not to contact law enforcement, it doesn't mean that you um, are ineligible to receive um, support or medical treatment, right? It's essentially going to be your choice. We do very, very highly recommend that you contact law enforcement, especially if this is um, a very violent or dangerous situation that could be violent or dangerous for somebody else um, in the immediate area. Um, and I, I put a picture of some of our UPD employees. Um, the taller woman in the blue, that is Detective Brown. Um, she handles a lot um, uh, or a majority of the cases that are associated with um, consent violations. Um, she's very thorough. She's very caring. Um, so that's the actual face of the person um, who will be on the other line to help with that investigation. 
So if the violation happened um, off campus, um, definitely call 911. Um, but if it happened on campus, um, you'll want to, and you're using like a campus phone, you'll want to call 41000 to get contact in contact with UPD. Um, I also highly, highly suggest reporting to Title IX. Um, so Title IX's website is um, shsu.edu backslash title IX. I always get that confused. Um, so I, I kind of remember like IX, like iPhone. I don't know. I just do whatever I can to try to remember it's IX for, for nine. But um, Title IX has a... Um, a feature on their website where you can report, and I'm going to pull it up on my computer and share that. Okay, so here is the Title IX website. Um, and, you know, everything is digital these days, so there is an online option to report. So you'll just click this report online tab, and then you'll fill out um, as much information as possible. And then again, it has up here, if you need immediate assistance, contact UPD or call 911, right? Um, and so they review these reports during business hours, uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. So that's important to remember. Um, so you can fill out um, as much information as possible. If you are not um, someone who is interested in filling out an online report. There are also other ways that you can request information. So right next to the report online, there's the more information button. You click that and you scroll down. You put, it gives you another option to report online. You can report by phone, Monday through Friday, eight to five, um, or you can report in person. And they're in the Thomason building, um, which is near the, um, the Consumer Sciences building. Um, or near Austin Hall. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of right next to Austin Hall, and they're in Suite 302. And New put some really good information in the chat. Um, she said you can report 24 hours a day. Again, walk-ins are welcome Monday through Friday. And we have support services, and reporting does not mean a formal investigation. Um, and there are interim measures to keep you safe and help you get the support you need for classes and living on campus. So there's there are tons of resources available um, by reporting with Title IX that wouldn't be, uh, nobody would know to make them available if um, there were no report. So that's very important to make sure um, that if you have been violated to um, report to the Title IX office. So if you are needing medical attention, um, you can call the, the um, Student Health Center. Um, but the Student Health Center, um, basically they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll, they'll give you all the support. They'll come in, listen to you, get your um, information, and they'll refer you to a SANE nurse at Huntsville Memorial Hospital. Um, and SANE stands for Sexual Assault Nurses Examination. Right, um, and so kind of students are always interested in what that process looks like, right? So if you if you present to the the emergency department at the Huntsville Memorial Hospital, let them know that you've been um, sexually assaulted or raped. Um, they'll admit you, and they will um, assign you to a sane nurse. Um, and so this whole process can take some time, about two to six hours, um, but they'll do their best to make you as comfortable as possible while you wait. Um, you may also have a local advocate called to speak with you about your safety, your emotional concerns, and that advocate can come um, in person or can be um, spoken with over the phone and virtually, um, just kind of due to the COVID uh, pandemic right now. Um, so you'll register in the emergency room or the emergency department waiting room. You'll be put into a private room while you wait to be seen by the nurse. Um, and then the nurse will come in and she'll They'll talk to you about everything that's going to happen. Um, you won't be examined um, or touched or looked at without your permission. Um, and if you give your permission to have the examination done, they'll take um, pictures of any injuries. Um, they'll 
you know, treat any injuries that you have. They'll collect evidence um, and they'll store that away. And again, this exam will be provided for you whether or not you want to um, press charges or talk to the police. And what they'll do is they'll keep that evidence um, and they'll file, file it away for a number of years. I believe it's five, don't quote me on that, but they'll have it saved and filed away for a number of years um, to be there in the event that you would like to pursue legal action. So this is some other information about who you can talk to on campus. Um, on campus, we have the Student Counseling Center. Um, all students have access to um, a number of very qualified um, mental health professionals um, that are all up in the Student Health Center. Uh, right now, they are seeing students virtually, um, but that is a resource for all students. Um, also, there's the number for the Title IX coordinator, and they have an abundance of resources that you listed in the chat. And then some community resources that you can take advantage of is the Safe House. Um, they're right there on 75. Um, so there's someone there you can talk with. Um, and then there's a couple of hotlines. Um, there's the National Domestic Violence Hotline and then the National Sexual Assault Hotline, right? Um, so don't feel like you have to write these numbers down. You can Google all of them as long as you remember the names. Um, so Safe House, um, National Domestic Violence Hotline, National Sexual Assault Hotline. Um, and these hotlines will connect you with national and local resources that you can take advantage of. All right, some benefits, um, and, and you kind of touched on some of these, but some benefits of um, reaching out to these resources. Um, one, uh, to an extent, you will have you know, confidentiality, right? When you are assigned um, an advocate at the hospital, they keep your information confidential. Um, you have that option to have that forensics medical exam, that um, exam to treat your injuries, even if you decide to not report. Um, in some cases, they will offer you um, pregnancy prophylaxis um, and even STD or STI prophylaxis if necessary. Um, there's counseling services, um, follow-up treatments that will make, be made available to you and then the educational and living support that you mentioned that's offered by um, SHSU's Title IX office. So what if it's not you who's had their consent violated? You know, what if it's um, somebody else that you're concerned about, right? Um, so first you want to be um, an active bystander, right? And in a social setting, um, an active bystander isn't always necessarily, you know, a friend. So you don't have to know a person to be a bystander, right? It can be someone that you see is maybe in distress or being harassed or, you know, looks like that they might be into, you know, be, being taken into a dangerous situation or a sexual situation without their consent, right? Um, just anyone that you can look over and easily recognize that they may not be safe, right? Um, in this case, if, if you don't feel confident, don't act alone, you know, maybe gather a friend or two or even a stranger or two and let them know what's going on and have them confront the harasser, you know, with you. Um, there are power in numbers. Um, and so uh, it may make you feel a little bit more comfortable and it may drive the point home to whoever the harasser is a little bit harder that, you know, there's a community who's not gonna stand for um, that type of behavior. Right? And then use your privilege. And, and what I mean about this is, and, uh, and, and it's kind of hard to imagine social situations because COVID, but in some situations, maybe you're a part of an organization who's hosting, or maybe you are um, a bigger person, or maybe you have a bigger presence, right? Um, those are all things that you can use to your advantage to confront another person, right? Use what you have um, to alter the situation, right? So if it's, if it's your party or your organization, um, your group is setting the social norms. And so you're gonna hold people to that, right? Um, 
I always think about like, you know, when you're at someone's house, there's always like a room that you just don't go into, right? And so anybody who lives in that house will say, you know, we don't go into that room, we'll get in trouble, things like that. So uh, that's kind of similar, right? Use, use your privilege, use your status, um, use your stature if possible um, to, to ensure another person's safety and to be an active bystander. Um, and then if you do have someone that is in need, um, just offer your support and your affirmation, right? I like to remind students that um, it is not your fault if someone else violates your consent. If someone else disrespects your con consent, um, you are not to blame. There is nothing that you did wrong, right? And it's important to affirm our survivors with that message and support them any way you can. And support doesn't have to be saying just the right thing, right? Support can be walking them to Title IX or um, escorting them to their mental health um, counseling appointment, right? So support can come in very silent ways, just sitting there and being there. So lastly, I just wanna leave you with this image. I got a button from, um, um, not on my campus, which is a, a great advocacy group on campus um, that says consent is mandatory and it has sexy crossed out, right? So we talked about how consent can be sexy, right? It can be very sensual, but at the end of the day, it's extremely mandatory. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no way to really dress it up or sugarcoat it. Consent is mandatory. You must, must, must have consent. Um, Anything short of that um, is a violation and is no longer um, is no longer healthy, safe, or consensual sex. Right. So that is our lunch and learn for the afternoon. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Thank you all for your time and attention. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to drop them in the chat um, or email us at healthpromotion at shsu.edu. Um, but there's a poll, I believe, that uh, Shannon just launched. So if you just take a second to fill out our poll, we would greatly appreciate it. And we hope that you can attend some of the um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month events that are happening this week that we discussed um, tomorrow. Uh, just a reminder, is the Male Sexual Assault Victimization Panel um, at 2 p.m. in the CJ Courthouse, or in the CJ Courtroom. And then on Thursday is the Take Back the Night Rally in March at 6 p.m. And then all of the rest of the events, you can find them online, on Twitter or Instagram, at S-H-S-U-S-A-A-M. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Brittany. You're very welcome.